All right, so we did a good portion of this lesson last time, but I stopped at a specific spot because it kind of changed gears, and the gears that we were about to change into is properties of exponents. And um, I want to talk through all of these properties. Those of you who've had Math 1, we've talked through some of these, not all of them, um, and maybe not in quite as much detail. So the first thing I'd like to do with you is I'm going to show you what the different rules are, okay? And then after we take a look at what the rules are, I'm going to actually show you why they work. Because it's really not a bad thing if you get it to a test and you absolutely cannot remember. But if you can't figure it out, that's kind of more problematic because that means you didn't understand the process behind it to begin with. Okay? So let me show you a few of these. Um, the first one, do you remember what happens when you have two exponents that are at the same base, A and A, and you have them raised to an exponent, how you can write that in a more condensed way? Okay, so M plus N. Yeah, it's addition on this one. And I, like I said, I'm going to show you why these work in a little bit, but let me just get them for you first. Um, so then on number two, number two is almost like number one, except that instead of multiplication, it has division. What a difficult time when you use this plugin. Okay. So on number two, we've got division instead of the multiplication. So instead of addition, we're going to use subtraction. So we do m minus n. <coughs> All right, take a look at number three. How is number three different than number one? There's some parentheses. What else? There's not two A's, right? I don't have the base A written a second time. So what I actually have is I have a base inside with a parenthesis, like Mackenzie mentioned, and then I've got another exponent sort of written on the outside of that, you know, in addition to the one that's on the inside. This one's the one that you were trying to give me before, Brendan, and it's multiplication of those two exponents. Okay, so when you have an exponent raised to another exponent like this, that's multiplication of those exponents. <coughs> Four and five are very similar. Um, they each have these objects inside that are raised to an exponent on the outside. And when we have that, we have sort of like a distribution property going on. So I can actually distribute each of these exponents through. And I can do it for multiplication. I can also do it for division. I'll show you why in a minute. And then how is number five and number six different? How are they different? There's a negative involved. Do you guys remember what happens when you have a negative involved in an exponent? Lexi, what happened? You flip it. And what Brendan's remembering is something about going to the bottom. So if you had a negative exponent on top, you can move it to the bottom as positive and vice versa. Since this is a whole fraction, you can flat out flip the fraction upside down. So instead of a over b, it will be b over a. And then the exponent comes through as positive because I flipped it, and it's still an exponent of m. I really want you to know why these work, though, because if you forget which rule you're supposed to be using, you should be able to do yourself a simple example and say, oh, yeah, that's the one that goes like this, okay? And also, when you have some child asking you, but why do I add instead of multiply, you can do a concrete real quick example and say, oh, it works like this. Because these are not hard to actually show why they work. So let me give you some examples. So on the first one, you see we had the a to the n times a to the n. And we're going to do the example of a cubed a to the fourth. So what does it mean to have a cubed? Three a's, all multiplied, right? So that's a cubed. And what does it mean to have a to the fourth? Four a's. So how many a's do I have there? There are seven, aren't there? So this is a to the seventh. And how do you get from three and four to seven? Well, you add them, right? That, that's why this works. That's, that's all there is to it. So that's why this actually becomes a to the m plus n instead of multiplying them. Okay. We can do the same thing with a to the m divided by a to the n. So we'll do this specifically a to the fourth and a cubed. So if I've got a to the fourth, you guys told me a minute ago that that's four a's. And the a cubed is three a's. So we can write them as such. Then what? 
yeah, we can simplify them by canceling out like terms, right? So reducing fractions, just like we've been doing with some of our other fractions earlier in this chapter, so we can reduce them in pairs because it's multiplication, right? And I'm actually just left with a, and that's understood to be a to the 1. So how do I get from 4 and 3 to 1? I subtracted them. Yeah. Okay, so in number three, we had that power to power thing going on. Okay, so what does it mean to have a cubed again? Three, three A's. And then I've got that squared. So what does it mean to have something in parentheses squared? All of that doubled. Yeah, I like the way you said it, doubled, exactly. So I've actually got three A's times three more A's, and those parentheses are just sort of identifying to us that doubling. They really don't matter, right? Because it's all multiplied. So how many A's did that give me? Six. And how did I get from three and two to six? You multiply. This is A to the sixth. Is that good? Okay. Let's do the next one. All right, so when you have two values that are multiplied inside and they're raised to a power, we have this sort of distribution kind of feature that we said was going to go on, and let's talk about why that works. Well, anything, like you just told me a moment ago, that's raised to a power, if that power were 2, like we did on the last one, we doubled it, right? This power is 4, so what are we going to do? We're going to quadruple it. Brendan's giving me my excellent um, vocabulary for today. We're going to have it four times, aren't we? And here is where a property of multiplication comes in super handy. You have a property of multiplication that allows you to move things around. Do you remember what that property is called? Commutative. The commutative property allows me to change the order. So what that allows me to do is actually regroup all my A's at the front and all the B's at the back. You see, that's unique. That doesn't always work, but it works with multiplication, then I can do that. So I actually end up with four A's and four B's. And you can see that four transferring through, much like a distribution kind of property would feel like it would. So this is A to the M, B to the M. Number five is even clearer because I don't actually end up having to regroup. I've actually got the A over B four times. And what you know about multiplication from earlier in this section is that we multiply straight across the top. So this is in essence having four A's on top, four B's on bottom. So this is A to the fourth on top and B to the fourth on bottom. So I didn't even have to move the order around. Okay, so um, on number six, what I want to show you is I want to show you how to think about this a little bit differently. I want you to think of that negative four as two numbers that are multiplied together. In particular, I want you to think about the number negative one and four. So we're going to put the four here first. I'm going to do the same order that I wrote down earlier. I know that I can break negative four apart into four and negative one. And I can separate them as a power to a power because of that same property we had on number three. Right? If I were to combine these back together, they'd become that negative four. <coughs> Alright, so without going into too much detail, that a to the a the a to the I'm sorry, the a over b to the fourth is the same property on property five, right? I know I can distribute that through. So I know I can write this as a to the fourth over b to the fourth. And I've got that negative one. And that negative one is a reciprocal feature. It reciprocates whatever fraction you're looking at. So then we have the b to the fourth on top and a to the fourth on bottom because that negative one tells me to do the reciprocal. And you can think about it rewritten like that or you can think about it written as b over a to the fourth whereas it just take the negative and flip the fraction at the same time. So I had written this before as b to the m over a to the m, I believe, on your previous slide. Any questions on those? 
Okay, I'm going to show you two additional properties um, that are very helpful when you're working with fractions or work, yeah, working with uh, exponents on fractions. One of them is a to the zero. Have you guys seen a to the zero before? Anything to the zero power is what? One. And I want to show you actually why that works because it looks like uh, it's almost like a trick or like it's just a memorized fact that doesn't really have any good reason for it. But there's actually a really concrete, easy way of thinking about why this works. So I want to show you how to think about this. Let's say we have that a to the zero. And what is one way of getting the number zero? That's one way. What's another way? Somebody said subtract. I heard it. Subtract what? A number from itself. So let's say that I had 3 minus 3. You could use whatever number you want, but 3 minus 3 will work just fine. Well, where in the world would a, of a to the 3 minus 3 come from? Well, it actually came from property number 2, where we had a cubed over a cubed. Okay, so I'm looking at that property in reverse, right? And that property, we actually started here, and we moved back this direction. We started on the right-hand side of this and moved back to the left. But I can go the other direction. I mean, it's an equality. It's an equal sign. So I'm allowed to go in either direction. But now this says you've got a number, a to the third, divided by some other number, a to the third. What's a number divided by itself? It's one. You see that? Any number divided by itself is actually equal to one. And the other one is, and we've already talked about this one sort of as a, maybe a little bit more complicated example, um, is that we have a number raised to the one, the negative power, in this case negative m. And so earlier we saw it as a fraction, and Lexi said we flipped it. So Brendan, you said we did what to it when it looked, you, you used a different language, do you remember? It's a reciprocal, but what can I do? How can I rewrite a to the negative m? You used the language, something like put it in the denominator, I think is what you said. You said put it in the denominator. And in that case, we had a numerator and denominator, so it sounded kind of awkward to say put the whole fraction in the denominator, although it was technically correct. It just sounds a little awkward with fractions. Here, I don't have a fraction to talk about. So talking about a reciprocal still means the same thing, flipping it. But in this case, what we're doing is we're moving a negative exponent down to the denominator. And we can do the same thing again with that a to the negative third as an example. And um, if you think about it, we can write a is a over 1, right? And then from property number 6, we can flip that fraction as 1 over a. And then we can distribute the power through. But what happens on top when I do 1 cubed over a cubed? What is 1 cubed? 1. So that power of 3 doesn't really have any lasting effect on the number one, does it? So you end up with, in fact, that one over that same variable a in this case to whatever power you originally had. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to actually use some of these properties in some problems, okay? All right, so here's the first one. Um, we actually have um, some a's and b's on top and some a's and b's on bottom, and there's more than one way to do any of these problems, but the directions tell you that in the very end, you're supposed to have a simplified expression so each exponent, will, I mean, each base will only be in there one time. So there will only be A written there somewhere once. And there will only be a single B written there somewhere once. And you have to have positive exponents when you're done. So multiple ways of doing it. What do you see? What would you like to try? OK, so Brendan would like to move the exponent that has a negative in it up. Does that sound OK with everybody? That's kind of that last property, number 8, that we were just talking about. We can do that. So this is a. I'm going to move the a cubed up, just put them together. And then I still have a b to the fourth on top. And I have a b squared on bottom. OK, that's one way to handle it. Now what? You want to reduce the b's. OK, so how are we going to reduce the b's? OK, so I could actually write this like. I have a, I have a cubed, and I could do b, and then I could subtract the 4 minus 2. Okay. You don't have to show every single step of this, but you've got to show me something. You can't go from the beginning to the very end. I want to see how you did it, because there's multiple ways of doing it, and I want to know how you're thinking, okay? So if I do this, then I'm going to get b squared, but I'm not done. 
4 minus 2 is 2. Now what? Combine the A's. Combine the A's. How am I going to combine them? Am I going to multiply them? You're going to add the exponents because they are multiplied, right? Yeah. So this is an A to the 1, even though it wasn't there. We understand that that is what that means. So how many A's am I going to have? A to the 4th. So this is A to the 4th B squared. Any question on that? Okay, what's different about number 2 or part B? Got some parentheses. There's something more glaringly different. There's some numbers in there, huh? <laughs> there are numbers in there. I want to make mention of this to you because your students that you work with are going to work with numbers probably before they're going to work with letters on this. Right. To be honest, the letters are easier to work with than the numbers. Isn't that crazy? Um, now, one of the things that you should know about the numbers, however, is that in the final answer that you have, I don't want a written out long, ugly number. I want numbers that are small with exponents because that's the whole point is that you've used exponents to work through the problem. Okay, so the small base number is what you should have with some, you know, potentially larger exponent on it. All right, so the other problem here is um, that in the first problem you saw A and you saw B, and you saw matching A and matching B as bases, right? You saw, oh, the A's, they match. The B's, they match. I mean, they had different exponents, but they were the same base. The problem here is that the base are different. The bases are different. This says 2 fifths, and this says 4 20 fifths, and those don't match which means I cannot combine the 3 and the negative 6 at the moment because the bases don't match. It would be like somehow combining the A and the B's exponents together. can't do that because the base A and the base B are different. So the first thing I've got to do is I've got to get those bases to match. So how am I going to get 2 fifths to match 4 20 fifths? What's that? But if I multiply times 5, it's going to affect that exponent too when things are going to get kind of hairy. Any other dice? Any other ideas? I'm going to go a little bit different direction, but starting out the same way that you had in mind. You guys know this is 2 fifths, and 2 over 5 cannot be reduced, correct? 2 and 5, they can't simplify with each other. I can't write them in any other way. But 4 could be simplified. How could you write 4 as a product? 2 squared. Two squared or 2 times 2, right? So I'm actually going to write this as 2 squared. How could you write 25 as a product? 5 squared. And why in the world would I want to do that? Because now I have a 2 and a 5, which is what the other one already had, right? Okay, we're going to do one more step in reverse. Well, you know what? Let's not do it that way. Let's just do it straightforward. There's a property here. It was number two, I think, that we had. We said we had a fraction A over B, and it's raised to the power of three. What can I do with that power of three? Distribute. I can distribute it. And I don't want to simplify. I mean, I'm not interested in writing out that two cubed is eight. I'm just going to write it as two cubed and five cubed. Everybody good with that? Same thing's going on here. I've got these exponents, but the difference, I mean, I've got these, this fraction raised to these exponents. The difference is that this exponent, I'm sorry, this fraction has exponents inside and outside. So I can distribute this negative 6 into the top and into the bottom, but how will I rewrite 2 squared to the negative 6? Okay, let's deal with the, the 1 over in a minute, Brendan. So take a step back on that one. What else can I do without the... Ignore the negative issue. Negative 12, right, Lauren? Okay. So I can write this as 2 to the negative 12. Is that okay? And then I can write that, of course, then as 5 to the negative 12 as well. Okay, so again, you could have moved it to the denominator. That would be okay kind of like it in the numerator right now just because the twos are both in the numerator. Is that okay? They're on the same sort of portion of the fraction. So if I keep going with this one, I will still have a two on top and a five on bottom, but what will the exponent on the two, the single two now be? Negative nine. Negative nine. And how'd you get negative <coughs> nine? Yeah, three and negative 12 added together 
right? I'll write it in just in case someone's not seeing what we're saying so far. This is 3 plus negative 12. <coughs> and again, 3 plus negative 12, which is negative 9. You don't have to write that if you see it. That's great. So this is 2 to the negative 9 over 5 to the negative 9. But I can't leave it like that. So if at some point you get it to this point, you can't leave it that way, so you're going to flip it. They're both negative, right? So I need both of them to switch locations. So this will be 5 to the ninth over 2 to the ninth. If you're checking the back of the book, you might also see that written as 5 over 2 to the ninth. So you might see this, or you might see that, right, as though it's the fraction 5 halves to the ninth power. Either of those would be plenty sufficient answers. I, I make absolutely no claim whatsoever that there's, there's one way to do that particular problem because several of you were saying different things at the same time and they will all result in the same answer if they're done properly. Okay, so there are lots of ways to get to that one. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about where this leads us. So as you keep working your way through mathematics, you end up with problems like this where you're trying to use this idea but inside of an equation sense, okay? And this has all kinds of applications to it, all right? It's a, it, really good applications when you get into algebra, um, pre-algebra, algebra as well. So as you're taking a look at this, again, from the perspective of the young ones you're working with, there's still no reason why you can't work this problem from what you already know without any other equation ideas whatsoever. The point is that we would need to get both sides to have the same base and then compare the exponents. So right now on the left-hand side, I have two bases. They both happen to be the number two. How can I combine those into a single base of two? Uh, two to the Give me just a second while it comes back up on the screen. In theory. Okay, let's try again. Brendan, what did you tell me to do? Uh, two, two, okay. So, same base, I can add the exponents, right? N plus 7. Now, over here on this side, I have the number 64, which is not written as 2 to a power, but that's what I want it to be written as. I want to write this as 2 to some power. And so, you, if you don't know it off the top of your hand, head, you can grab a calculator to practice, and Mackenzie, you know it. What is it? It is the 8. Okay, if you were to put in your calculator 2 to the 5th, 2 to the 6th, 2 to the 7th, 2 to the 8th, 2 to the 9th, you'll eventually find the one that's going to be 64. All the problems that you work with are going to have that feature. Okay, they're all going to work. Then you're going to compare the exponents. What in the world would n have to be to make n plus 7 equal to 8? It's 1. That's it. n is 1, and then it's going to work. Okay, now part b is the same. Except that, nicely enough, it's already written as one single base to a power on the left. It's got an inequality, which doesn't affect the way the problem works whatsoever. Okay, so you're just, the answer is going to have that in there. However, the right-hand side is written as a fraction. Okay? <coughs> what can we do so that it maybe isn't written as a fraction for much longer? Maybe one to the negative one. Yes, and... Um, Somebody else was saying something else. We'll get to that in a sec. So I can write this as 81 to the negative 1. That's a good first step. What else? Try to get it to be a base 3. Exactly. So again, if you were to grab your calculator, didn't know what you wanted it to be, um, or if you were to even do a little bit better, if you were a little bit further along, a little bit higher level of math students, you're working with um, students who'd had this idea of factoring, you could actually take 81 and say, what does 81 break down into? Oh, it's 9 times 9. And what does 9 break down into? Oh, it's 3 times 3. And pretty quickly you'll find that 81, one way or the other, is 3 to the 4th. Right? It will. It will work out 3 to the 4th. And properties of exponents on the right-hand side, then, how do I combine this so that it doesn't have the parentheses with power to power? Multiply those powers, and what would that give you here? The negative 4, right? So again, your whole point was to get them the bases to match, 3 and 3. 
Now you can compare the exponents, n and negative 4. So the n and the negative 4 have the property. And what sign goes between? Less than or equal to because that's what's in the problem. This sign is part of the solution. Okay, so whatever the sign was in the problem is going to be the sign in the solution as well. All right. We're going to do a couple of approximation questions. Um, well, one's approximation. Um, the other one is a, a kind of an application problem. Example 8 says, approximate the following product. We have got 20 and 1 third divided by 9 and 7 eighths. And if you're just approximating, what would be much more helpful to use in the process of this division? Whole numbers, yeah. What nice whole numbers might we want to use? 10 and 20 would be awesome, wouldn't it? So 20 is going to come first, yeah? So roughly 20 divided by 10, and this would answer would then give me 2. So whatever you're doing, if you were working that actual problem out, this is one of those things that we've talked about um, at different points in mathematics where you look and say, does my answer make sense? So if you were actually doing this problem, work it out long style, you were actually dividing 20 and, two and 1 third by 9 and 7 eighths, and your answer that you get is 22 or is 9.76 or whatever, if it's not a number close to 2, you've got an error. And that should be sort of a red flag, right? So this answer should be close to 2. All right, let's take a look at an example that's application. This is a really interesting one, um, and it can be done, again, in multiple ways. Jasmine is reading a book. She's finished three-fourths of the book, and she has 82 pages left to read. How many pages has she read? So suggestions. There's more than one way to do it. So suggestions. What would you try? Okay, so why would 82 equal one-fourth? Okay, so we're almost perfect. Your reasoning is good, but I don't think that 82 actually equals 1 over 4 of the book. I'm going to write that in here. So even better, how about I say pages of the book? Is that okay, Brendan? Okay. So she's read three-fourths of the book, which means she has one-fourth left. Everybody follow that okay? Okay. And we're trying to say that she has read one-fourth of the pages of the book. The question actually asked, how many pages has she read? So now what? You could. So you could write out, flat out, just jump to the solution that it's asking for if you're paying attention enough to figure out what the question asked. Right? The question says, how many pages has she read? Well, if she has 82 left and 82 is, three quarters of the, I mean, is one quarter of the book, then we could just multiply this by three. And I'd have three quarters of the book. Does that make sense? Because it really never asked me how long the book was. I mean, I could find it that way. It wouldn't hurt anything. I could find out how many pages are in the whole book, and then I could subtract 82 if we wanted to do it. But this will work, too, and it finds the answer directly. So what is 82 times 3? 246 pages. And wonderfully enough, I didn't even really have to work with fractions. Not really, did I? Certainly not multiplying them in anything of any consequence. Okay, let's do one more. Okay, Al gives one half his marbles to Bev, Bev gives half these marbles to Carl, Carl gives half these marbles to Danny, and Danny was given four marbles. How many did Al originally have? Okay, so, so you gave me a wonderful answer, that's great, but how do you get there? Okay, so I'm going to key in on one of the words you just said, going back. You're going to work backwards, right? Working backwards is a really good method for doing this, and we're going to write down a little bit of the work to get there so that if we were explaining this to a child, that's actually what we would do, right? We would say, I'm going to start with the last person, which happens to be Danny in this case, and Danny has how many marbles? Four marbles. 
And let's see, she got them from Carl, correct? So Carl had how many marbles? Eight, because he actually, he doesn't have eight any longer, mind you, does he? He has four now. But he started out with eight marbles because he gave half to Danny. And then before Carl was Bev, and the problem could be done more difficult, right? It wouldn't have to all be one halves. So we could use some one thirds or three quarters or whatever in there as well, and we could complicate the process. But the process would remain the same. How do I get from <coughs> Carl to Bev in this case? I double it, right? She had 16 marbles before she gave part of them to Carl. And prior to her was Al, and so Al had the 32 marbles by working backwards. So Al originally had 32 marbles. We could also complicate the question simply by saying how many marbles does Al currently have? Make sure you're actually reading the question, right? Ooh, how many does Al currently have? 16. Okay. All right. Go ahead, write down the homework if your orange has not been printing out. I know some of your orange did not print out when you guys did notes on this. So while you do that,